All right, we're back, everybody. Another little jam session going on with Leviya, and uh, we'll see how this one goes once again. No editing, just gonna sit down and play some games. The last video had some amazing reception from the viewers, so thank you all for uh, watching it. I had a lot of fun. Uh, honestly, it, it was different than streaming games, getting to just sit down and focus on the game itself instead of juggling chat uh, actually felt quite nice. Uh, so one thing I noticed, though, uh, in terms of the, what the first video was lacking, was more of an explanation on sideboarding as we went into the game itself. Uh, so, let's talk through that a little bit. Uh, with this build right now, I think the only change from the last video is I'm trying two Diabolic and two Agile windup again. Changes pending, I was really happy with three Diabolic. Uh, but, can you get away with 21 Blues versus 22? Eh, we're gonna go back and, and see if we can, uh, but I was really enjoying 22 Blues with Call to the Grave. That's the one thing we're testing right now. Uh, we are going to Azalea and we won the die roll, which is great because Azalea gets like 10 extra percentage points if she gets to go first. Uh, so we're going to take going first. We're also going to take two pretty key recursion pieces into Azalea, being Ghostly Visit, which lets you play small hands really well into her, uh, and the Guardian of the Shadow Realm for when you flip. It is just insane. Uh, or even before you flip, it's pretty good into Azalea's Dominate. Uh, so not bad. We're going first here. And we have the potential to swing with Beast Within and discard Agile Windup for Graveyard Fill. That puts us at playing uh, basically a Blood Dead attack on turn two, because if we block only with one card due to Dominate, we would still be able uh, to banish three. So because of that fact, we are going to attack with Beast Within. But if this was the only card we'd end up with in Graveyard, I'd actually hesitate on even attacking uh, at all. But, uh, okay, if we leak a damage here and then also get the Agile Windup and a Dread Screamer in Arsenal, I will count this as a pretty big win. Uh, so, on their end, they even played Memorial Ground. I didn't see what they put on top. It was Spire Sniping. So they've drawn up a blue with Spire and Sniping uh, specifically. Uh, okay, so our hand here is short of blue to make most rates look good at all. That is unfortunate. That is definitely unfortunate. Uh, but we've drawn our ghostly visit, so there is upside in that as well. Uh, so the best thing we can do with our agility then is convert a claw into two cost type of play, uh, or two cost into claw type of play. Uh, so, you know, these three cards at least do that. I mean, the Dread Screamer also contributes to that as well. Uh, but the ghostly visit will definitely be a card we block with pretty much no matter what. There's also a world where we could cheese it a little bit. If we block with Dread Screamer, play Wild Ride, find a blue, and then Dread Screamer banish Ghostly Visit, play it all. Like, that That actually could happen. So we'll keep our eyes peeled for those lines, but generally to make use of this agility is just going to be kind of a baby play. Claw and attack. You know, there is uh, kind of a big gaping hole in not running scabs in this matchup, just because the Battle Worn 2 piece, it's big. Like, we, we can't deny. A battle-worn two-piece, an extra just two-piece of equipment that you get to use into Azalea's on-hits and dominates is very strong. So, in this matchup, you do have to find a window to make hooves look really good. Uh, in fact, uh, speaking of making things look really good, we're having our hand forced a little bit by this Seek and Destroy. We might just have to play Dread Screamer into Wild Ride. Or I guess we do it the other way, just in case we draw the blue, like I said. Uh, so... Yeah, we're just going to let this through. Just going to let this through. It's a two wide turn from them. Just period. Uh, giving a Scowling Flesh Bag like, might do something, but you normally want to look for double effectiveness on Scowling. You don't just want to use it to use it. If you can block a hit effect with it and potentially stymie a uh, two wide turn, that's pretty big. But for sure, we're blocking with Ghostly on the second attack here, and if it can double up, covering some kind of hit effect that would be nice as well like if they just throw the endless maw here like no pump right we would just block ghostly and hooves and maybe that wouldn't even be worth it like truth be told um you know they can always look for snap bullseye on an endless small line or on endless arrow line just because it is very high value because if we block with ghostly plus the hooves it doesn't change the fact that their arsenal um you know is always coming through they have this extra card. So if we block with Ghostly Hose, it's to deny Snapdragon Bullseye on Endless Arrow specifically, just for them to get an extra 5 value. 
I think that's a higher value line for them when they don't have an arsenal because then the endless arrow like continues over to that third time. Uh, so we're just going to give Ghostly Visit on this. And if they sack both these equipment pieces, I'm fine with that. It is just raw damage. It is just raw damage when they would have had an arsenal anyway. The extra push of an endless arrow hitting twice to then reset an arsenal just is not the world we're living in. Uh, okay, well, this is pretty dirty. My god. Alright, now they've made it dirty. Now, this is kind of gross, because a Bolton shot hitting then enables the Endless Arrow, which then goes to Arsenal again, and that is just wild amounts of value. Uh, so I think what we have to do now is actually uh, block, give Apex as well, and then hope Dread Screamer uh, hits the Ghostly Visit would be our best line. I guess we can guarantee that it hits the Ghostly Visit if we block with Mark of the Beast plus Apex. Then we know for sure Dread Screamer hits Ghostly. Yeah, so let's do that. Let's do that. Blocking this way is effectively stopping five more damage. Uh, we also could have given the, the Scowling, like, alone. Uh, right? and then kept that card in hand, that card in hand would have converted to uh, being able to play the Dread Screamer into the Wild Ride. Do we really care about pushing 12 versus pushing 11 and keeping the flesh bag up? I think, you know, it's pretty clear this is better. Uh, but both options were open. Because the other thing is we could have led with the Wild Ride, right? Uh, in the off chance that, like, the next hand that we get to, like, kind of swap the yellow for a blue. But if that wouldn't have hit, then we're just losing the Dread Screamer completely to Hub. So it would have been a pretty greedy line to try for that. It would have been greedy, I do admit. So I think this worked out fine for us. I think it worked out fine. Uh, let's see the top card. Top card's on the Worldly Bella. Okay, so there was a 50-50 chance that if we went with the other line of just play the Wild Ride first and see what happens, we would have ended up with the blue, two Dread Screamer, then hit the ghostly and actually come in uh, for 16 damage like that. That was a world we're living in. There was risk attached to it. So <laughs> kind of funny, kind of funny. Uh, but now Endless Maw is so strong into Azalea uh, because you generally just get to stop caring about Red and Ledger turns, right? Like you just come in for nine, two card nine, reset Arsenal. Uh, like, if they read in the ledger a hand like this, it's actually perfect. We get to block a card, we get to throw Endless Maw back, and we get two Arsenal. That checks every single box. So we'll see what they do. Uh, because, like, with Knock, of course, like, you would assume they go for a red and ledger turn. Where it gets a little bit dirty is if they stack uh, Lace with Inertia or Seek and Destroy on top. Which, okay, they just did. Seek and Destroy on top. So what we could look to do then is uh, block with hooves and just convert that extra card in hand that would get destroyed to playing Ghostly Visit again. I actually do kind of like that. I've played a lot of games into Azalea before where if you just hold hooves for too long, it just doesn't work. Uh, like you just don't get to use the card. Uh, we do have Ghostly like kind of hitting its loop though, so we probably will always have choices for it. I guess that's a little bit interesting. Oh wait, what, what am I saying? We're under Red in the Ledger, so we get no value after, out of doing that anyway, so we're just going to have to like accept that we lose a card to the Seek and Destroy, but it's really not the biggest deal. Uh, if anything, it helps Graveyard a little bit. So, yeah. No, we are fine with this at the end of the day. We are fine with this. Ooh, oh my god, I almost, almost punted. Almost punted. Uh, in terms of what we want to end up in Graveyard, the Diabolic uh, will help us a little bit more, uh, just because it will count as a 6 for Shadow on the Horror. It will, in theory, feed into Consumed if we flip that way. It will feed into, like, a Doomsday line, because we're still not at 6 yet. Oh my god, I almost threw with the hooves. It's, it's too late. It's too late. I'm staying up. I'm staying up because I'm trying to watch the League of Legends World Championship starting in just a few hours, but, whew, my god, I almost threw. Almost threw so bad. Hmm, okay. This is a bit of a dangerous hand to want to throw a Blood Rush on. Bit of a dangerous hand, because if we play the Blood Rush, discard the Dread Screamer, and then just, like, miss a Banisher, what do we do? But I'm not going to complain about seeing an a Blood Rush, like, at all, right? Like, Blood Rush is <laughs> it's too good to complain about in that sense. 
Um, but we might actually pivot to just like block with Graveling Growl, play out Dread Screamer, Arsenal Blood Rush Bellow. Uh, which, yeah, we absolutely are going to do because they hit us with Red and Ledger again. Uh, however, it's Red and Ledger not attached to Arsenal Disruption, and it's not attached to like a Codex play or something where they get ahead on Arsenal and really screw us. So now the fact that we're like missing the blue to make Dread Screamer Ghostly Visit like look so good actually doesn't matter. Because once again, they're hitting us with red in the ledger. Azalea's bread and freaking butter, folks. Azalea's bread and freaking butter. So, feels pretty good in the end, doesn't it? Oh, sleep dart. Okay. Well, this changes things. This changes things a lot because little do Azalea players often think about is the fact that we can use this to our advantage to actually still flip to consumed. So sure enough, if I block three on the sleep dart, right, I would take 10 down to 14, and then I can play Dread Screamer and still flip. That's pretty wild. Like, that is absolutely worth it. Uh, so thank you, opponent. Uh, they basically never think of this, and I am always looking to abuse this, uh, because now we get a guaranteed flip off uh, with Husk Up, with a Blood Rush in Arsenal. That is just absolutely insane. Uh, so thank you, opponent. I'm actually very glad we get to show this off because this is something in the League of Aya, um, a lot of players complain about quite a bit is like the Azalea matchup for one, which like, I'm not going to lie. If you go second into Azalea, you're just disadvantaged right off the bat because it turns zero dominates like that is a part of the matchup for sure. The other part of the matchup, though, that people complain about is Sleep Dart. And that one you have more play into because of exactly what we just did, right? Exactly what just came up. We are going to use this to our advantage. We are going to take Blood Debt to 13, right? We're going to take this first. We're going to transform. Then we're going to take two to the Blood Rot and just really not care that much. Not give a shit. Not care. Because we're consumed with Husk still up. So now these Blood Rush turns like get that much more consistent. And we have Ghostly Visit and Banish. This kind of wombo combo of, oh, I'll keep one blue. Yeah, I'll keep one blue and throw 10 at you. Is wild. But remember, Consumed doesn't uh, take away your ability to still play those recursion pieces. It'll be only one more time this game, because it'll go face down again um, when I do rebanish it. But a one card 10 is now available to us. This is wild. This is wild. Uh, so remember, we do have to use Husk no matter what on this turn cycle. Some opponents will notice that and just take an off turn. But not every deck can take an off turn that actually impacts the game. Um, you know, sometimes they can like drop potions or whatever that will impact the game. And the fact that I wasted Husk does hurt a little bit. Um, but, oh, no, you can't do that because you do need a resource opponent. Should probably take that one back. Um, but uh, Azalea is the type of deck where if they just don't attack you, well, sure, you don't use Husk, but like, my God, <laughs> you got to um, uh, still just like get a free turn. Uh, so what we're going to do in this situation is actually... Uh, keep the Guardian as our pitch card, just because we're guaranteed to keep resource cards in hand after the fact. Uh, so we're going to do this. Uh, also got to remember, Scowling won't look that good here, but Scowling will probably never look that good again into this matchup, uh, because they're going to be under so much pressure from this Blood Rush uh, that it intimidating a card really won't do anything anymore. Uh, so we're going to pitch the Guardian. We're guaranteed to keep these resource cards, which we did. Uh, and now we kind of get to go a little crazy. We get to go pretty insane, pretty insane, uh, with Claw into Claw into Dread Screamer into Graveling. Like, should be our turn, uh, which is just disgusting. A four-wide Blood Rush instantly after the flip turn, thanks to the Sleep Dart, people. Thanks to the Sleep Dart. And we keep going. All right, the opponent will just die on this turn cycle. They will literally just instantly die on this turn cycle. Uh, so we even could have cracked hooves for the ghostly visit. But there you go. That, that, definitely kind of a best case Azalea game. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, but we got to show how withholding armor actually, uh, you know, is to our benefit in terms of trying to line up where exactly the hit effects matter. Not every Red and Ledger is actually that bad, right? Not every Red and Ledger really stumps you. We almost threw on that, like, one Hooves decision. But even thinking back to that one Hooves decision, notice we ended the game with Hooves still up. 
And that's actually something that I've noticed in a lot of games. I'm being very patient with hooves. I'm trying, I'm waiting for these like perfect draw sequences. But if that just doesn't happen because the game's condensed um, due to like opponent's pressure uh, or maybe, you know, things are going wild because we just didn't draw these power cards and like the ideal never turns up. Sometimes just like using hooves opportunistically uh, for like those smaller value plays like I was thinking about with the ghostly would make sense. I'm glad I didn't punt that though because it was under red in the ledger. But with that said, uh, let's get in an Enigma game because actually the Enigma matchup has gotten a lot harder. Uh, the Enigmas has, have pivoted their builds to play more into 10,000 Year Reunion. And 10,000 Year Reunion is a very problematic card uh, into Leviah. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That card is degenerate. It is disgusting. And the fact that we are not building our deck to run scab skins right now, we're not building our deck uh, to run like Reckless Swing right now, actually hurts a lot into the current Enigma builds. Um, so... Let's see how this matchup goes. Uh, I actually, I'm actually back and forth now on the Shade and Death Hydra in this matchup uh, for the pulping slot, just because more aggression really is needed. Uh, so we're going to play without the Hydra in this game in particular, uh, but we are going to add in our other recursion sweet cards. The other thing is, because we need to be more aggressive, we're playing Savage Sash, and Savage Sash uh, just scales better when we add more draw discards. So we're going to make that little bit of a swap. Uh, whereas into like the old Enigma play patterns, I would absolutely take Shade and Death Hydra. But my god, you just like gotta kill them right now. They are not a fun deck to play into. Holy freaking moly. Um, okay, now we look at our hand. Uh, we could send the Tear Limb from Limb just for Graveyard Fill. Um, but you gotta remember, if it ends up where we don't have like three... where If we would only have like Banishers to follow up with, or like we draw a red, discard this, we wouldn't even be able to play the beast within. It just won't line up super well uh, to like always know we get value out of that card. So you could look to rip it just for two cards in Graveyard and that's that. But this is the Enigma matchup where we actually need every push possible. Excuse me. We need every push possible. Like it is so important to use your power cards to go above 12. It's so wildly important. Uh, that I don't think we can waste a tear limb for limb just for that. Uh, so graveyard fill. Was it worth kind of giving this, giving them this window? Well, we'll see. That's actually kind of tough to stomach that things lined up so perfectly for them. Um, but graveyard fill, knowing that we'd get a six in when we have a shadow realm horror, felt like it was going to be worth it. Because turn cycle wise, if we just don't attack, then not having a six there stalls how we get to use Shadow Realm Horror. So that did hurt a little bit, not gonna lie. That did hurt. So this is actually um kind of a funny hand. I've seen this hand before where we're incentivized to just block with Diabolic for zero because we're guaranteed to just play it out with Shadow Realm anyway. Uh it it's come up and it's it's quite funny. It is quite funny to see that happen. Uh so we're hoping we get to just block on it. Secondary attack here. But there's no reason not to. Like, our hand wants to play Shadow Realm into a one cost. So, the way to do that is, uh, yeah, block with Diabolic for zero. No joke. Uh, and this, this won't matter. In theory, if they pummel it, like, that's wild. You know, good on you if they, if they actually pummel this. Uh, but it will not affect what we're doing here. Sixes are sixes. Erase face does not, does not do anything to attacks. Um, so, Shadow Realm now, like this, this was important. The Beast Within in Graveyard like actually matters because we had the Shadow Realm. So you do make choices differently on turn zero based on what you know your arsenal to be. If we didn't have that six there, then we don't get to return a play like this. We just don't get to do it. Uh, so now we're cycling in a new power card into arsenal. Very important. Very important. Uh, Terra Limb for Limb as well, like it's a guaranteed one of in our list. Uh, so to know that we get to play with it early before we really have to worry about um, like a high impact failure state late game with blood debt is also quite nice. This type of hand with it is a little bit interesting though. A little bit interesting, not gonna lie. Uh, how do we even want to play this hand? We can play this hand a lot of different ways, honestly. We could either keep the Howl in hand and just commit to playing... Howl into Pulping into Claw, in theory. 
Uh, we could also block with the Howl and then hope that we you know we actually get the Dominate and don't discard one of our other blues. That's a lot of hope to go Pulping Claw Claw. Uh, we could also just keep the Howl in hand to call for a Beast Within uh, and then overpitch Howl and the blue for Tear Limb and then we're guaranteed to at least be able to play a two cost from Tear. That's kind of awkward. Uh, I think we just like have to get the Howl in Graveyard first and foremost though. It will be very important for this matchup. So for blocking with Howl, I think we'll do it here because there's a chance they just drop like a Haze Bending uh, and then Arsenal the other card. So we're getting this out of hand. Let's just go ahead and do it. And we also have the choice to call and then Tear Limb. That is, that is possible. Uh, that line can also change because depending on what the call hits, uh, it could change our like primary attack for one. Uh, it could also mean like the tear limb never works because it could be like a three cost and then we just can't risk it. Interesting. Interesting hand. Luckily it's early game so we can like take some experimental lines with this. Uh, but more than anything, right? Like we just need to apply pressure. Just need to apply pressure. All right, let's go for call. See what we get. We get a Wrecker Romp. Well, that's pretty exciting. It's actually very exciting. Because now there's some added redundancy to playing out the Pulping. However, it's not added redundancy to playing the Tear Limb. Because if we play the Tear Limb pitching the Dread, uh, and then end up discarding the Pulping, the Wrecker Romp like, will not be playable as our 6. So I think this leads us into wanting to play the Pulping. More than anything. Uh, if that is a defense reaction, so be it. It's going to be a little bit tough to stomach. Uh, but we only took one damage for the call line. Uh, we did take some extra damage on the Restless Coalescence. So that would suck, because in theory we could have just blocked three for like a same line. Uh, but we're hoping this works out for us. We are hoping. Okay. So it did hit the Dominate, but we lost the Wrecker Romp. This will at least follow up with a Claw Attack, in theory. In theory. The Dominate might help push through the ward, like that's kind of the idea, right? Is, uh, if that isn't a defense reaction, then we get free clear from this, which is nice. So it looks like that worked. It actually looks like that worked. Okay, <sighs> breathing a little bit of a sigh of relief here, because sometimes you absolutely get stuffed on plays like that. And they're keeping their full five. Well, let's see what happens. Okay. Okay, we have a guaranteed Beast Within discard hand. Uh, we are leading with a yellow, so we probably want to block with Sash just to make sure. So we're going to block with Endless and Sash most likely. And if they are setting up a board, then we want to also block with Apex when we block with the Endless Maw. Let's see. Let's see. All right, we can get a little bit cheesed here if we go ahead and block with... Well, actually, we don't get cheesed, because if they come in for 6 damage, then we can just block with the Endless Maw, Apex, and Hooves on the next thing. Uh, so blocking with Sash here is safe. Because at minimum, if they just end with like some kind of Spectra Aura, I want to make sure we've gotten 2 life out of Sash. Okay, but that's not what's happening. Nice. Nice. Okay, so we're actually like getting pretty good reads about their turn now, because this can't even be like a Miraging Metamorph or something. Uh, so we get a block with the Endless Maw, guarantee that we hit the Beast Within off of the Blood Rush. This is all fine and dandy. Uh, dissolve Reality. That's also fine, because our turn wasn't built around the Tear Limb. Thank God. And actually, oh wow, that would have been wild if our turn was built around the Tear Limb. Jesus. How much damage have we taken? Please just one or two. Okay, one, and it was a dead- Oh my lord! Good stuff, people, good stuff. Uh, sure. So our hand goes Claw Claw Dread Screamer if we sack the Savage Sash. Our turn goes Claw into Endless Maw if we don't sack the Savage Sash. Uh, no matter what though, I guess it... I guess it does lead with Claw. Like that's always part of the turn so we can see how they block on this. Maybe change our decision. Savage Sash feels very weak to play just for... One. We we could also because we get the ponder, right? So like there's no harm in just playing out the endless maw here. Yeah, th there's no harm. So we're just gonna do this. 
Uh, okay, got some misses out of the way. We still want to be hitting that howl, though. <sighs> okay, please be a good ponder. Uh, we know for sure that some bad ponders are out of the way. A wrecker romp is out of the way. Uh, that's pretty much the worst one. I guess if it is a bad one, we can still leave it because they're probably going to dissolve reality again at some point. So that's nice to know. Nope. Okay. It's always scary, though, when an Enigma doesn't block. Okay, well, they're, re they're changing things. They are giving us a Command and Conquer now. Which might be wrong, because in theory, like, the CNC would be live. We get a Ponder here. Uh, uh, pretty medium arsenal there. Still a playable one, though. Still a playable one. Well, pretty big Muragai turn out of them. Uh, so remember, these Muragai turns, we, like, basically need to instantly answer, or we get pretty screwed. So... We might have to uh, go for some kind of like Sash Dread Screamer turn on this. Uh, like Sash of Dread Screamer is like possible. How would that line look? Yeah, I mean, that line works best if we end up hitting a Howl because then uh, like the resource curves look great because it would be uh, Dread Screamer. We crack the hooves, we go Howl on top of the Writhing into the Deadwood Rumbler, like all the Sash, yada yada. Uh, the problem is, if we crack Sash, we are at three misses. Uh, I mean, we have to clear these boards, though. We have to clear these boards, so we have to go for it. Because we can't really go for a board clear and block on the same turn. It's just like, it does not function. It just does not function. Pretty awful, but uh, that's the positions that Enigma puts you in. Into a weakest link. Okay, that weakest link is vanilla here but can we even go to two like that is absolutely wild to just accept fate well i guess we wouldn't go to two because we'd block with hooves we would be blocking with hooves you know I, i'm i'm in i'm in i'm gonna go to three it's not a real three because we still have apex to block with um but uh yeah we also get two banishes to try to hit the howl is the other thing it's not just the one. So we're going to crack Sash. We really can't miss on this Sash. I mean, if we miss on this Sash, it's like literally over. So there's that. Oh, thank God. Uh, okay, so we actually don't need to break Sash or Hooves yet either. We can uh, keep the graveyard a little bit cleaner for us. Okay. Oh, God. Well, we did not hit... Yeah, we didn't hit the uh, Howl from Beyond on the Banishes there. So now this is going to look awkward. I think, like, we had to play in that line because we had to assume that, um, in theory, they fight to keep the Miraga on board. So us committing Sash early, like, kind of had to happen. But we're just missing, like, three damage straight up from that line. Just missing three damage straight up. Uh, because now we don't get to cast Howl on top of this Deadwood. With two resources floating. Oh god, and we mill a Blood Rush. Yikes. 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 I mean, we're not out of this game, is the good news. Like, we're not out. We have been clearing. They are down their Traverse. But, man, that does not feel good. Oh uh, god, a Rage Spectre turn. Oh, Jesus. All right, this is a Rage Spectre turn where we have to answer with Spoiled Skull, or we, like, basically lose. Uh, so we're going to go like this and then commit to Spoiled Skull and see what happens, but boy, it is not looking great right now. Not looking great right now. Drawing a Doomsday would be, like, really nice in this position. Try to get us back in. Uh, so we're gonna go Blood Rush. Uh, oh, you know, I honestly didn't even check. I just assumed we had a Dread Screamer in there, but we do not. That's wild. That is wild. Uh, we drew the Blood Rush, though. That's nice. No, we just need to turn off Blood Debt. Uh, we can turn off Blood Debt. It's also nice. 
Whew. God. This game is getting tight. Enigma games definitely can get tight. Uh, you can have a strong early game, or you can have this. Which was, like, kind of the middle ground. A little bit of the middle ground, you know? Um, but we have momentum here, right? Like, this is, this is the board clear. They're at six. We still have an armor block. Like, Enigma can fall in these kinds of positions. And we found Doomsday. Oh, God, but we're down hooves. We don't have hooves to just do, like, the blowout lines. Oh, that's so sad. That's so sad. Uh, well, still. I mean, we go... Here? God, we hit the howl. Oh, man. Oh, that makes this so wild. It is more damage up front to just play the Howl into the Mark of the Beast, right? Obviously more damage. Uh, however, they will have to answer the, do the Doomsday, so we're just gonna, like, let the Howl sit, and next turn, it will hopefully take effect. Right, like, they, they, have, to they have to answer Blasmophet, in theory. They have to answer Blasmophet. Um, the other, actually, this is, this is interesting as well. So what comes up here with Mark of the Beast is, we could have just died on the spot to drop on the ocean, because they could minus one on Mark the Beast, and it just wouldn't turn off Blood Debt and we'd die. So buffing it with the Unworldly Bellow actually protects us from dropping the ocean killing us, which is quite nice. Like, that's... thank god, like, because that would have been awful. Um, not many Enigmas know that, but uh, Mark the Beast banishes itself from the combat chain. So you would just, like, instantly die. Um, but now we, like, might come back. We're in a spot where... Even if they try to, like, throw a big hand at us, uh, you know, life is under pressure here, and we will have summoned Plasmafet. If they don't answer this, this is, like, a really good comeback mechanic, especially with us being able to flip Redeemed in, like, one more Banish. In one more Banish, we can flip Redeemed pretty easily. Oh, God, this hand, though. This hand, though, is terrifying. This hand is terrifying. This hand is so terrifying. Oh, why does it have to be the wild ride here? Literally any other card, I would feel so good. Oh, okay, they're attacking Blasmfet. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank God, they're attacking Blasmfet. They're they're smart though. They're smart. Like I think that's that's our way back in the game. Anyway, is Blasmfet stays up. But Jesus, Jesus. This is still, like, not a good position on our end, though. You know, our only way to turn off Blood Debt in this hand is to play the Dread Screamer, which means, like, we only get to follow up with Claw. Which is just awful. We could hope to banish and flip Redeemed. Like, the Hail Mary play, if we really think we have to do it, is play the Howl and then need to hit three Blood Debt cards. Which, um, which would be the dread, the endless maw, and the howl specifically. Oh my god! Like I think, I think we lost on this on this draw. Unfortunately, I think we lost on this draw. If we had one more resource card, we'd be in this game. One more resource card, we'd be in this game. That's so unfortunate. Uh, like we're we're missing even dread screamer into deeper to evil. Like this is really tough. Really tough. Oh god, and we didn't hit 13 on that banish. I think we lost the game on that draw. I think we lost the game on that draw. Oh, come on, opponent. What? Uh Okay, that confuses the hell out of me. What on earth? Their hand at minimum block 7. Uh, and, no, even more, because they could pitch this plus Tunic to at least Miragai. And they had Arsenal hold the line? I do not understand that concession. I don't understand that concession. Um, so I would call this one, like, a, a pretty close loss. But, like, this should have, this should have been a loss. Like, honestly, things could have gone differently on our end. Like, we could have gotten a little bit luckier, obviously, on, um, some of the positions we're in right now. 
um, you know, like we missed the howl on that triple wide hooves turn. We also committed the hooves like on that kind of turn where in reality, saving it for the next turn cycle where it would have smacked them with unworldly into Mark would have been better. We didn't know that was the draw sequence, but, um, you know, I think we got a little, uh, a little carried away on like a mid game decision and also a bit unlucky, uh, as well. But this, this one should have been a loss. So well, I mean, we'll take that for the stats, but okay. Uh, anyway, let's play probably like one more, uh, just because, uh, we want to keep these videos like around 40 minutes, uh, and we're playing into Vincent. And so into Vincent, I want to go first because, uh, if they go first, they basically start with a free rune gate. Um, you know, like not only a free rune chance, but like a free rune gate. Like they get an extra card that they can basically go too wide with later, yada yada. It's pretty dangerous. Uh, so into Vincent, uh, however, you get to run Guardian of the Shadow Realm to like really good effectiveness. Like it is always a good card. It blocks seven when you see it the first time because you get to pitch blue with AB. Uh, and then when you flip it, blocks seven again. Uh, so also into Vincent, generally what I found is you don't win the game from being uh, like a Blood Rush abuse deck. Uh, you win the game off of flipping. And that's really because Face Purgatory has changed the matchup a little bit. Uh, so sacking a uh, Mandible Claw for an Arcane Lantern can kind of equal out when you find your window to just like pop hooves on a Blood Rush turn anyway. Uh, we did not open with Graveyard Fill, which is kind of unfortunate. Uh, but we open with a good arsenal. And you can play the early game a bit slow into Vincent if you want, right? Like, definitely, you can deny Deathly Whale type effects, right? For sure. Uh, you can pitch into AB. You can block, because you can always block at least, like, two cards and get full value. They go tall, right? Uh, so that is an upside. That is an upside. However, if they don't do anything, then we are slowing quite a bit. Slowing down quite a bit. Uh... But now it doesn't hurt us to go ahead and do this. We can overpitch as well. Um, does that really change anything? It would like make the chances of not discarding a blood debt card better if it is a non-blood debt on the top, which is nice. Like that is good for us. Um, but banishing a Dread Screamer in a matchup where we're like always flipping is also pretty nice. So actually, I think we're going to overpitch the Graveling Growl because we're going to discard a six. I'd rather it be the Dread Screamer. So this will be an interesting game to play out then because we are missing the ideal early game for sure. And we also didn't even like get to use our hand efficiently by blocking them. They just took a setup turn, uh, which is one of the reasons we try to go first in this matchup is to deny the setup that they get going first. And they basically got to do that for free. So we'll see how this plays out. Definitely not an ideal start. Not an ideal start. It will be ideal if we like draw discard a guardian right now. That would be great. That would be the best case. Uh, so opponent is thinking perhaps on instance in play. I don't know what those would be. Uh, maybe the haunting, mal malefic haunting or whatever the new black card is. Might be triggered in his hand right now. Um, but yeah, so I mean this matchup generally I've found to be very close. Uh, I think it is slightly Leviat favored. Um, but there are a lot of blowout scenarios from the Vincent. Okay, well, that was not great. Banishing a Deadwood is, like, pretty much a wash. Um, it will, I guess, feed into once we do flip, but it is not a good flip card, especially since we're not running Sash in this matchup. Um, but generally, I'd say Vincent has a couple blowout lines that definitely hurt this matchup. Like, if you, uh... Uh, if they, like, play a Revel out, uh, that can interrupt how you're trying to flip. Um, but if you can line up your flip turns uh, to where they also are, like, behind on rune chance, then you can you can get ahead, like, quite a bit if you play it that way. It's not easy, but it is possible. Of course, uh, this type of scenario is also, like, quite gross. Um, but it's one of those where, once again, we're under no pressure to really play the game yet. Our graveyard isn't where we want to be. So we're going to pitch our non-blocks into the rune chance. And then just block over the top. 
And we'll take one blood debt to this. That was the that's the downside of a Deadwood Rumbler when there's no cards in the graveyard yet. It is kind of sad. Um, but this is just a slow early game. It's just a slow early game from both of us. You know, they took a blood debt, I'll take a blood debt. You know, we'll we'll keep it fair. We'll keep it fair. You know, one for one right now. Uh, but now it's time to play the game. Can we really play the game with this hand effectively? Kind of, right? Like, you know, dread into swing big is fine. Is it ideal? Not really. Uh, we could also just play a swing big hand. That's fine. That's actually probably what we'll end up doing, to be fair. Uh, we could also just block out again. They've got a red Mavrian Sky, so we do have to block this anyway. That, that kind of does have to happen. It is only three rune chants as well. Uh, so I think we'll just go for the pretty face up line here. Um, so right now, I mean, we still want to find power cards. Uh, Call to the Grave is a power card, but the game has started enough where I'm not too comfortable just like straight up drawing it, um, especially when the recursion piece we're trying to target actually is quite playable anyway. Uh, right now, ooh, that's a lot of blood debt right now. Uh, so actually, let's go for the send packing instead, because uh, we should be fine to just, you know, banish those eventually anyway. And uh, we just don't need the extra blood debt out of the hungering. Um, and not like it'll really be detrimental, but in case we do take blood debt when we weren't expecting to, like the one point of difference might matter. Bounding Demagon now is... A problem for if they play succumb in this position. If they play succumb here, it wouldn't gain them an action point, but it would let them target discard from our hand, uh, which is actually pretty gross because they would take our hungering, you would assume, and then we're even losing the might. So, like, that is pretty gross. But can we really do much about that? Like, we really want to play this nine point swing back, right? Like, we really want to. So, scowling, like, man, do we really do that? There's no way, right? Like, there's no way. Another scenario where having scabs would completely protect from that playline. I don't know. But am I wrong, actually? Can they even play succumb as an instant? Because we haven't taken damage. So maybe they, like, can't even do that. Yeah, actually, I don't think they can do that. I I've totally forgot how that card works, but they can only play it as an instant if we've taken damage, I'm pretty sure. And we blocked all the damage so far that turn. So I could just be totally wrong. Uh, don't mind me then. Don't mind me. Uh, so with that, return with a swing big. You really gotta love some of the runeblade support. Uh, it's wild. This set has really done a lot for the game. Uh, in terms of like broken things going on, I think there's, <laughs> there's still some of that. There's a lot of broken interactions. Uh, runeblade still can feel like the class that says, oops, I drew all my M's and just win. Uh, but the play patterns are starting to feel so unique hero by hero. Like, it, that to me is starting to become wild. Like, every hero plays so differently, and yet we're a game where most matchups are still quite close. Uh, and, and that's awesome. I mean, that is just a great game to be playing. Okay, so now we have a pretty easy curve of a 3-card 12 with Dread Screamer. Uh, I, hmm, okay, we've got it even easier now, actually, because we get to go Dread, Dread. Oh, we don't, we don't get to go Dread, Dread, Boneyard. Never mind. How do we make full use of this hand, then? Uh, yeah, there's... Wait, is there a world where we actually get to play the Doomsday? No, right? So we need to banish... Five more. And we only would be able to add four more. No, that's not true. Yeah, we could do it, can't we? Mark the Beast gets us to two. Then we ban it. No, because then the resources wouldn't work. Oh man, that's actually, it's close. Funny enough, if the Hungering Slaughter Beast was there, we like almost would be able to do it. Uh, however, it means we get to put the Doomsday and Arsenal, and it's, like, quite live. Uh, so, that's cool. That's really cool. Uh, 
So yeah, let's just do this and then pitch into the Mark of the Beast. Uh, and then we'll be one banish away from Doomsday being live. I guess the other option is we could just close the chain and play Boneyard Marauder. And then we're like really almost there. Basically instantly there because we can carry and husk. How greedy is that though? To just like go to one card in graveyard. It's a little greedy. It's a little greedy. We do know that they have widespread destruction though. So does that change what we want to do? Huh. Yeah, does that change anything then? Because we know for sure they're going to attack us with widespread. So maybe we do close the chain, play out the Boneyard Marauder, uh, then we can arsenal the Mark of the Beast, and then we are guaranteed to be able to play Doomsday. Well, that's kind of interesting, right? Because now we're at five. We're going to arsenal the, the Mark of the Beast, uh, and then at minimum, not even under pressure of using Husk, we can Doomsday. All right. All right. Now we're thinking of some crazy lines. All right. We like this. We like this. Okay. Sure. Yeah, so now we get to basically eat the rune chance and not worry about the widespread trigger because we need we want that trigger, right? We want that trigger. Uh and then we can uh block with two cards, doomsday, swing back, right? We're totally fine with that. This worked out, did it not? Mm-hmm. Block these. We're going to lose our Mark of the Beast. We get to Doomsday, though. And it'll put an Endless Maw as well in our flip. Not bad. Very interesting lines here, actually. This was kind of spicy. I really do feel, though, if we... Like, truly, that's hilarious. If we blocked with the Hungering instead of the Send Packing we would have been at six for the doomsday sequence. So we, I was talking about like taking blood debt uh, as the downside, but the upside was literally to draw sequence at doomsday like instantly. So that's just my bad straight up. That's just my bad immediately on that. Wow, that's wild. Like actual impact on blocking with hungering. We would have been at six on the last turn, instantly just hit hooves doomsday. The, I guess like the arsenal is always going to be gone though. Because for sure they would widespread. And widespread... Each hero who has lost... Yeah, so widespread could attack into Blasmo. Uh, and I would still just instantly lose the Mark of the Beast from Arsenal. So that, that line was always happening. So I guess like the nifty play that we did uh, was just to kind of recoup the fact that uh, we didn't have six on that exact turn. So... Value-wise, value, value -wise, it's all the same in the end, I guess. It's just now we get to keep hooves for a different turn. So maybe it's not that bad. Like, maybe this did spread out how we play our turns. Uh, because in a way, if we'd, if we'd swung with the Blasmfed on that last turn, they play the widespread into it. The widespread would have hit with the red Mavrian Sky. And then they get to throw the Deathly Will as well. So actually, it would have unlocked more damage for them if we played out the Blasmfed. That's wild. All right, so you know what? We're now geniuses. We've talked ourselves into being geniuses about how to play that turn cycle. Nice. Nice. Hmm. We even have a potential juicy Shadow Realm, but it hits the Graveling. Not going to bet on that, though. The safer line on this is if Blasmo stays alive, obviously, Shadow Realm into Blasmo. Easy. Probably is not staying alive, though, so our turn is most likely Endless Maw and, like, block a card on the, on the Bonds of Agony, right? Where is this going? Oh, wow. Okay, this is going at me. Oh, that's wild. This has got to be wrong, right? This is... This is not right. There's no way. There is no way. What's wild is, like, I really feel like Scowling Fleshbag destroys whatever turn they're trying to put together here. Uh, but if we Scowling Fleshbag, then we will not be able to uh, Shadow Realm without using Hooves. But then maybe we just pivot to using Endless Maw, right? Like, just Endless Maw. This, this feels kind of broken, right? I 
I could be getting baited. This this could be Revel in Arsenal, and then they just play the Deathly Will out. But that wouldn't kill Blasmophet. So I really feel like we're protected from Blasmophet dying if we do this. We just are. And that's kind of the benefit of uh, Scowling Fleshbag into the Rune Blades. Like, I, I really can't give up the head slot to Spoiled Skull. It would be the easy swap, but you've seen, like, we haven't played Blood Rush this game. This has been a zero Blood Rush game. Uh, and we're just getting to control the game off the back of, uh... Yeah, okay, yeah, see? This literally is lining up perfectly. This is exactly what we wanted. Now our hand got full value. Oh, oh he hit the blast. Okay. Oh, never mind. Not full value. Uh, so I think we're committed to just always using the hooves. Uh, it's the most damage to go Endless Maw into Blasmophet here. Uh, and we, yep, use hooves. Swing Blasmo. Uh, and then in theory, our next turn will probably be Endless Maw again. And then our next turn will be Horror. Uh, oh, or they block with Face Purgatory. Okay, this is perfect. We actually like this a lot. Uh, so we have two misses in the graveyard right now, so Shadow Realm Horror is like not ideal. It is not the ideal, so it looks kind of gross, but we're going to get rid of it because I don't want to build my turn around uh, missing when we have sacked the hooves for that play. Uh, so actually, didn't even think about kind of baiting the Face Purgatory, but it made our hand have full value. Uh, so we, we really appreciate that. We do, we do. Uh, okay, well, this hand is strange. Um, basically, yeah, we don't get to do everything this hand. We don't get to play the Guardian and the Endless Maw. Uh, we get to, like, block with a Swing Big, play the Endless Maw, and then Arsenal the Guardian would be, like, the most live line, in theory. Uh, but if they're killing the Blasphemous, then, you know, we have options. We have options. And I would think they are. Like, this is a pretty clear opportunity for them to kill Blasmophet. It's not a Mavrian Skies, it's the Shadow Puppetry, but in a way, Shadow Puppetry helps, right? Because uh, this pushes it plus one to six. Mav Skies, in a way, is like more damage because, uh, you know, they could follow up with the Flail on Blasmophet and like still send all the Rune Chants in between. But, you know, it's all the same. Kind of. Is it the same? It's kind of the same. This better be a Blasmo fit. If it's not, what is going on? Alright, that's a Blasmo. Thank you. Thank you, opponent. Uh, now they'll likely flail, and we can block with the swing big, and do our thing. And then we get to play our Endless Maw and Arsenal the Guardian, and we will be happy. That is a very good hit from them. Very good hit. Please attack with Flail. I don't want to look like a buffoon. Thank you. Alright. Yep, because we literally couldn't use that card anyway, so... That card dealt them a damage. We have converted a Swing Big to dealing them one damage, and we got the upside of it going to Grave. Uh, also, Arsling the Guardian into their Widespread Destruction is pretty hilarious. Pretty hilarious how that's going to line up. Uh, and they've got to answer the Endless Maw as well. I mean, this is coming in for nine. So, I just want to reiterate, folks, this is a zero Blood Rush game. Zero Blood Rush game. I'm telling you, the, the play into Rune Blades is a lot of value. Uh, granted, this, this Vincent didn't get, like, insane value off, but I think it's really because we didn't ever play into Succumb. Uh, literally, no turn I can think of played into Succumb. You know, we're always, like, front-loading our blocks. And that helps a lot, obviously. In like not letting Vincent get the blowout turns. Uh, okay, well, that's good on them. That's very good. They're running sigil. Something to note in case we flip this game, but uh, we have a wild amount of blood debt. Oh my goodness! Okay, this is literally the miracle draw. Literally the miracle draw. Uh, we get to block seven with these two, and then we get to blood rush with beast within. So that's. Pretty wild, isn't it? That's pretty insane. Just insane. Everything is above rate with this turn. Oh, okay. look, look, look. They think they're playing into Temptation, right? 
Disgusting. Disgusting. How long have they had that succumb to temptation in Arsenal? I think that's been their Arsenal since, like, has that been their turn one Arsenal? I'll have to go back and watch. I think that's literally been their turn one Arsenal. Is just sitting on succumb. So, shout out again, like, we've literally played around succumb every turn. Every turn. And now they're just going to die on the spot, in theory. Because uh, we don't even need this blood rush. Oh, like, we can't go through out of this blood rush, in theory. Um, but this is still massive for us to go claw into attack, uh, into arsenal. Uh, yeah, even drawing triple reds here, like, we're not on, like, double claws or bust. We are going to mandible claw, we are going to boneyard marauder, and then we are going to arsenal shatter on horror. And that's just disgusting. And we even... Okay, well, there's still two misses, so actually the Shadow Realm is a bit questionable. Uh, I... Mm, I wonder, actually, if the Wild Ride would have been a better arsenal, just because, in theory, it lets us push an aggressive flip turn. It's not going to super matter. I think we're, like, very ahead this game to even worry about these things. Okay, so... Yeah, I mean, we can just flip uh, and, like, maybe win from the pulping hitting dominate anyway, right? This is three rune chants, which, which puts us to 14. So we don't need to block the rune chants. The rune chants are perfect. And then we just block two cards and try to hit the pulping. And if it hits... Cool, they might just lose. Um, and we would flip anyway. Uh, so, of course, we want to go pulping, pitching the, the Wrecker Rump, uh, because they've shown they are running the Sigil of Suffering. Uh, so, blocking with Hungering and Scent Packing will work out better. Oh, come on, please play the game, opponent. Don't concede. Don't concede. Don't concede. Please. Please. Mr. Long John, please. I want to play it out. I want to play it out. I want to play it out. Ah, okay, nice. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Zero, zero. Yes, we go here, here. They've got nothing. Uh, we could hit a Beast Within, which might change things, but then we win on the spot anyway if we hit Beast Within, um, because we would then just throw the Shadow Realm Horror at minimum, even if we drew like a red, uh, and we would probably just win. Uh, so. Like, we- okay, so we don't hit the dominate, that's fine. This turn, that was not really our goal. Our goal was to flip to 13 and protect ourselves from their instant damage of Sigil, uh, which we've successfully done. If we hit the dominate, then they'd have to give us equipment. Uh, since we didn't, they don't have to. But we're still checking, like, every box. We have not flipped with Guardian. We had a chance to. I think we had, like, two turns to banish it. Uh, but we did not. So that shouldn't matter, because we have... Just a whole lot of go again going on, uh, and that will be enough to close. They're at two after all, and they are Vincent. So let's transform. Boom! Look at that. Look at all the go again we drew. Insane. We can take this. We can take this. We can block with this. Don't need it. Uh, so we'll just go Dread Screamer into Endless Maw and, like, in theory, win. Uh, actually, depending on the banishes as well, which there are still two misses, so we don't need to do it, but we could go Shadow Realm into one cost as well, and we'd win off that. Uh, we win off a lot, not gonna lie. We win off of a lot of things. Uh, but one of the lines is this one. Boom. Done. Done, done, done. All right. GG's, opponent. GG's. All right. Pretty good games today. Pretty good games. Um, yeah, that was not... I mean, hey, look, you, you saw this is a game played without Blood Rush, uh, playing around their succumb more than anything. Uh, granted, I think the opponent had uh, at least like one or two turns that were like a little bricky, it looked like, but it was kind of off the back of us not letting them cycle out their succumb. Uh, and then when they played Face Purgatory, obviously it lined up beautifully for us. They didn't know that, but that's like kind of what we wanted, but that was incredible. Um, but you gotta remember, with only running one claw, we're actually less susceptible to face purgatory uh, than normal, because it can be very tough into rune blades if you go claw, and then on the second claw, 
they face purgatory. Oh my God. Like that can literally just punt it anyway. Uh, so I think that worked out. That worked out great to show off the deck that way. Uh, so let's see. Where are we at right now with all these games? Uh, well, we're at 78. So the decks dipped a little bit. Uh, remember, this is version two of the list. So we're probably at around maybe 300 games total or so uh, played. But uh, Levi is just continually treating me very, very well. And I'm incredibly happy uh, with the deck and can't wait to play it a little bit in paper this weekend. I'll be traveling out to Battle Hard in Milwaukee uh, to stream uh, with Diem Armada and Sam O'Byrne. That's going to be incredible. Uh, but I will also be bringing the deck and uh, jamming some games with at least Sam Dando. And playing Levi in paper is always so exhilarating because uh, one of the things that you don't really get to do on Talishar a lot is the consumed pitch stack kills, where because of, like the tactile memory of knowing like which blues are where uh, and flipping and counting out your deck and like knowing what hands you draw, all that is a part of the game that like I really only can do in person in Talishar. Just remembering arbitrary numbers of like oh one two three four five six okay minus nine like that stuff just doesn't work. Um, so in person, there's some parts of the game that just get like a lot better. Of course, playing in the flesh and blood as well. Uh, but anyway, that was just another quick gameplay dump uh, because I couldn't sleep and uh, the League of Legends World Championship is starting in just a few hours. So uh, thanks for sticking along the ride and I'll see you next time.